Hello and welcome. My name is Scott Moreland and I work for Palladium as a health economist in the U.S. Palladium is a global company working with governments, businesses, and investors to help solve some of the world's most pressing problems. Today I wanted to talk to you about the importance of data. This is part of the Kuwait Data Map Project that was carried out by the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Science and Palladium. The project aimed to understand the state of available data in Kuwait and challenges to develop a roadmap to help Kuwait leverage data to help achieve its Vision 2035 strategy. Let's start by talking about decisions. We make decisions all the time. How should I dress today? Should I have I wear a coat? Should we take the baby to the doctor? Who should we vaccinate first for COVID-19? Do we need a new airport? All these decisions have a couple things in common. One thing is that some action is required, taking the baby to the doctor, putting on or not putting on a coat, vaccinating certain subgroups of the population, or investing or not investing, as the case may be, in a new airport. But they also have something else in common, and that's data, which can be used to help make the decision. So decisions are guided by data. When we decide whether or not to wear a coat, we do that on the basis of knowing what the weather is, and particularly what the temperature is. Is it going to be too cold or too hot to wear a coat? Taking the baby to the doctor requires knowing whether he or she has a temperature. Knowing who to vaccinate against pandemics such as COVID-19 requires research and data on which population groups are the most vulnerable. And building an airport requires knowing what the current traffic flow is for airport traffic and uh, what it's going to be in the future. So a common ingredient in almost all decisions is having some kind of data. And we deal with all different kinds of data in our daily lives and in the institutions where we work. We deal with geographical data that describes the characteristics of physical locations where we live or where we travel to. Cultural data about religions and different ethnic groups. Scientific data, which comes from surveys, experiments, clinical trials of new drugs, for example. Financial data coming from firms, banks, and even our own bank accounts. Meteorological data on the weather, which helps us to predict what the weather is going to be. And over the longer term, such things as global warming or climate change. Data about nature and the environment. Track changes in the natural environment and biodiversity, the number of animal species that live or, or, or don't live, as the case may be. Transportation data about car flows, airplanes, boat traffic. And there's a lot of other data as well that I could mention, but you get the picture. How is data useful? It's useful in a lot of ways for making different kinds of decisions. It can assist in finding solutions to problems, helping organizations to develop strategies to set and achieve their goals, providing information to advocate for some change, such as a new social policy or revision of an existing one, and knowing how you're doing, whether that's an organization assessing its progress, whether it's educators assessing student progress, or keeping track of one's own health. All these uses lead to data-informed decisions. Now, these decisions take place at various levels, at the level of the individual person, at the family level or household, at the level of an organization or enterprise, the level of the government, and even internationally. And in each one of these levels, different types of data can help in the decision-making, and oftentimes the same data might be used at different levels. And some decisions also take place at multiple levels. For example, in health, we establish care standards for children, such as vaccination requirements. And this, that affects individuals, the individual child, but also the family. And these are set at the, at the level of society, and usually by the government, for example, the Ministry of Health. Some laws and regulations affect us at different levels, for example, the requirement to have a driver's license to drive a car or a passport to travel internationally. Restaurants often have minimum requirements for levels of hygiene and food safety. All these regulations require some type of information and data. And at the, even at the international level, we have requirements and treaties that governments sign on to, for example, in the area of international human rights. Children quite often have the right to an education or being safe, and governments and societies buy into those. Now, decisions are not made by one person only, and are not affect. And decisions affect more than one person. And we refer to these various people or groups as stakeholders. And stakeholders can make or influence decisions and can be affected by those decisions. And in the, in the slide that you see here, there's several different types of stakeholders. There are individuals and families, government leaders, private sector, religious leaders, government ministries, NGOs, journalists, public sector organizations, and international organizations. 
And the multiplicity of stakeholders often makes decision making challenging. With multiple stakeholders, things get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Individuals and stakeholders will inevitably have different goals or may interpret the same goal differently, even if they are involved in making the same decision. So consequently, each stakeholder may use different types of information to support a decision in support of their own goal or their interpretation of what the goal might be. And even if they agree on the kind of data that's important to use, they may not agree on where the data should come from, and they may not agree on the interpretation of that data. They may see things differently. And this point about interpretation is important. It is often the point of conflict or disagreement among stakeholders in reaching decisions. We're all familiar with the conundrum of is the glass half full or is it half empty? Optimists say the glass is half full and pessimists say no, it's half empty. Now look at the two graphs on the right about the progress of income over a 20-year period in a fictional country. The graph at the top shows pretty steep progress, but on the bottom the line is fairly flat. So which graph do you think shows better progress? The one at the top or the one at the bottom? In fact, if you said no, they're both the same, you're correct because the origin of the graph at the top is actually the initial value of the income in, in the year 2000, which is around 100. But the correct way to present the data is as it is in, in the bottom graph, where the origin, the value in the, in the lower left-hand corner, is zero. And you can see that that shows a very flat graph. But in fact, the last value of the graph is the same. So the, so the information in the two graphs is the same, but the way it's presented could be very different in terms of its interpretation, and that could affect the decision that results from using that information. Now, of course, data is not the only thing that influences decisions. We shouldn't be too naive. Stakeholder interest groups can influence decisions in public arenas, and we've already talked about the stakeholders. Political ideology on the right or on the left can make a big influence, particularly on public policy decisions. Culture and religion obviously frame decisions at the family, individual, and public levels. Historical precedents, how things have been done in the past, can sometimes make it difficult to change the direction of decisions. Intuition is another influence. People bringing in anecdotal evidence to override or to, to contradict more co complete data can come in as well. And quite often, perceived views of the world or perceived understanding of how things work can influence decisions. So we shouldn't be naive to, to assume that data is the only thing that will influence decisions. But I do think that data should be taken into consideration. Where does data come from? What are the sources of data? Well, it depends on the kind of data. And each type of data has its own particular sources of data. There's research data coming from clinical trials and studies or surveys, census data about the population, where it lives and its characteristics, helps us to know more about what the population is, surveillance data for such things as the weather or crops or diseases, helps us to understand what's going on in real time, routine monitoring reporting systems for different systems, whether it's health systems or school systems or projects or the economy, help us to understand where we're going, where we are, and where, where we might be headed. Individual health records for people and public health records also are another source of information. Commercial and financial data for, for firms and organizations, another source of data. Tax records for individuals and enterprises is another source. When we have all sorts of data and we're making complex decisions, quite often we use different kinds of data in a mix to to inform the decision. And when we do that, and when we use that data from different systems consistently together, we talk about a data system. A data system is normally a system of data that's in a standard format, is easily viewable, has elements that are relevant to the decisions at hand. And when you have data from different systems that are connected to each other, we talk about those systems as being interoperable. So, for example, you might have data on education and you might have data on health. And if you put those two together in the same data system, we talk about those systems as being, those data as being interoperable. 
At a wider level, we can also talk about a data ecosystem. A data ecosystem refers to not just the data itself, but the larger environment and elements that support a data system. And it includes data collectors and the sources of the data, data storage systems, for example, the computer or the server where the data may be stored, the people who maintain the data systems, the analysts that process the data, and even the processes and procedures for producing the data products, the reports, uh, the graphs, and so forth and so on, that come out of the data, for example, to inform an annual report or a research report. And just like natural ecosystems, data systems can evolve over time as the demands change, as the environment changes, as different data becomes available, or as decisions get more sophisticated and more data is used. So data ecosystems are dynamic. Another element that's useful when we think about data ecosystems and decision making is the data use cycle. The data use cycle starts, as we've talked about already, with what is the decision that you want to make. And that decision defines the data that are required or thought to be required to answer and address the decision at hand. And once that data is defined, that's what we call the data demand, which sets up your data collection system, defines what data you want to collect. And then once that data are collected, the data become available, they're stored someplace, they're put in a, in a viewable fashion where they can be easily retrieved, and more importantly, used and analyzed in some way to inform the decision that you started with. And oftentimes you decide that, well, we don't have enough information. We need to change it. We need more information from the respondents, or we, we need to go back and dig a little bit deeper. And so the cycle starts again. We talked about some of the constraints to agreeing on the use of data when we had multiple stakeholders. There are also some systematic constraints that we often encounter when we talk about data use for decision-making. And these basically are summarized in this slide in the categories of organizational constraints, technical constraints, and behavioral constraints. Let's talk about organizational constraints. Organizations quite often don't use data as much as they could because there's no organizational structure for data use and management. There are unclear responsibilities of the data-related staff. There may be lack of data management skills of the staff. There may be lack, lack of data management policies and procedures. There may not even be a plan for or a strategy for using the information, or it may be intermittently or not regularly used. These can be overcome, however, by developing clear organizational approaches for data collection, analysis, and determination, ensuring that job descriptions and responsibilities of the data-related staff are included and they, so that they know what, what their responsibilities are, developing and executing data management policies and strategies, and instituting regular reviews of data tied to key decisions or regular reporting cycles, and ensuring an adequate budget for data. Behavioral constraints refer to the human element of not using data and overlap to somewhat, somewhat with the organizational constraints and also the technical ones, really. There may be, for example, what we call a lack of a data culture, meaning that the organization or the unit or the ministry or whatever level we're working at is not used to, it doesn't regularly think about using information and data to inform its decisions, even if those decisions are going to be made on the basis of other criteria, which we talked about before. And sometimes the high-level decision makers themselves are unaware of the data that are there, or they may not trust the data. There also may be poor or no incentives for decision makers to use the data. And the data that are there may conflict with the personal views of the decision makers and threaten their, the status quo. And then often we find in many settings that the, the, the lower level staff are reticent to present negative results to the higher level staff. And that gets in the way of data use. And negative data is just as important as positive data, even if it's in scientific research. So these constraints also can be overcome by sensitizing decision makers to the value of data, educating decision makers about the data that are available and its quality, and regular review of data and interpretation of the data in, in meetings, and again, providing job protections for data staff so that if they do present data that are not particularly rosy, they're not gonna get fired. Technical constraints are many, 
and that can include the weak technical skills of staff to store, use, and analyze data. It can include the information technology, basically computer technology and server technology for storing and assessing the information. It can include poor data quality that results from poor data collection practices. And the data may not be accessible in easily understood formats. These again can be overcome through a number of different techniques or strategies. For example, training and capacity building and data related skills, upgrading and maintaining information and communication technology infrastructures, conducting regular data quality reviews, organizing data capture and storage using best practices, and developing open data portals when appropriate. So we've talked a lot today about data, about its use in decision making, and about some of the challenges to using that. I want to talk briefly here at the end about some emerging issues in data, which I'm sure you've heard about and are familiar with. And here we can only really scratch the surface, but I just wanted to mention these because they might be on people's minds. The first one is the area of big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. And although these are three distinct areas, they kind of all merge together. The emergence of so much data and the evolution of data ecosystems has coincided, perhaps not coincidentally, to advances of computer technology. And that technology includes high capacity computers, but also the internet and personal computers, tablets, cell phones, and other devices that allow for connectivity and passive data collection, which we haven't seen before. Those systems allow the collection of masses of data, which is the origin of what we call this concept of big data, meaning these huge databases and systems that can literally be mined to guide solutions to problems. And with this has come a new field, basically extending the data analysis field to what we can now call data science, which basically merges uh, data analysis and research methods with understanding how to use these uh, standard tools of data analysis with these huge databases. An emerging track here is the field of artificial intelligence, sometimes called AI, and machine learning, sometimes called ML. And we've all experienced AI and ML when we, for example, log on to Google and search for something. Maybe we're looking for the recommendation on the best recipe for, for chicken. And then the next time we log on, or if we're on a different website, we may be given links to a cookbook which has recipes for chicken, or even a restaurant which specializes in chicken. Or we may be using Google Maps to find our way to a destination, and we make a wrong turn, and Google Maps tells us to do a U-turn, or to turn around and, and make a left turn rather than the right turn that it originally did. All this is based on AI, artificial intelligence, and data. With big data and artificial intelligence and machine learning come some challenges, however, in the area of data ethics and data privacy. Even when data elements can be de-identified from individuals, such as medical records, the very use of algorithms that use them and the consequences of that use raise some very serious ethical and perhaps even moral issues. We don't have time to go into this whole area of data ethics and data privacy, but let me just raise a couple of points here for you to think about. How much control do we have on our own personal data? This touches on concerns over data privacy, ownership, and consent to use. And even when we check or change the settings on our computer or on our phone or tablet to privacy, how sure are we that it really is private? How should the data be used and interpreted? How should our data be used for political and financial gain if it's our data? And finally, how do we control and prevent the misinterpretation of data or creation of disinformation, particularly when it's our own data? So these are a few of the issues of big data and personal data particularly come to the fore when we talk about this new data revolution.